So you're all invited to those. All of these events are free to the public. So the only thing you're having to pay for is the food, and the cost of that is going directly to the restaurant that catered to it. So we're not making any money off of that. Um, without further ado, I would like to welcome Mayor John Enken. I've known him for a hell of a long time. <laughs> it just seems that way. Yeah, we have to do a lot of engineering work together. It's tough getting anything built in this town, have you noticed? <laughs> I've often said that you can't even build a doghouse in your own backyard without your neighbor protesting. So, okay, um, John, please. Thank you. That is, one, that is one of the finest introductions I've had, ladies and gentlemen, in a very long time. I appreciate that, Shamil. Um, it is a pleasure to see all of you here this evening. I spent a lot of time in this church basement as a kid. Um, as a Norwegian Lutheran, um, you know, we don't talk about our faith. Uh, that's just not in the cards. Um, and I can tell you, um, this church basement never smelled as good as it does tonight. That is... That is not Ludafisk that's sitting over there. Um, it's, it's, has Ludafisk been banned? Yeah, he got rid of the S at the end of St. Paul's and the Ludafisk is gone. Should have, should have known, should have known. I could have waited it out. Uh, so over the weekend, I had a conversation with a reporter from Public Radio, Public Radio International who was in Missoula doing a story on refugee resettlement and the idea that a city in Montana, or as some people say, Missoula, a city near Montana, uh, that a city in Montana um, would be interested in hosting refugees. And part of his question was, what is it about Missoula that uh, makes room for, uh, for a project that has been rejected um, fairly soundly in some other places and um, has been rejected um, largely for um, reasons of politics and drama. And my answer was fairly simple, and it is that I have come to know in my 51 years living in Missoula, um, which still doesn't make me a native, I don't think. I'm not sure. You have to, you have to go about 70, I think, Jamil, before they let us. Yeah, see, there you go. Um, what I have learned in my lifetime here in Missoula is that we still care for one another and we still believe that we have a responsibility to one another, we have a duty to one another, and that we can recognize pain and suffering and that our place is not a product of a zero-sum game, which means if we help someone, we can't help someone else. What we can do here in Missoula, Montana is help everyone and do our part and do our share and try to take care of people. And this gathering is just another example uh, for me, another representation of the fact that we have a community that believes in itself and believes in each other and believes in the basic goodness and the basic humanity that we all own and we all deserve respect and we all deserve care and we all are in this together one way or another. So thank you all for being here to celebrate the fact that we're all in this together, to learn a little bit about uh, what may or may not be a mystery to some of us, uh, to learn more about the neighbors we may not have met in our travels around the community, and to share fabulous food and a few moments of grace in a place where people still love each other. Thank you. Thank you, John. I knew it was the smell of the food that brought you here. Um, so since we've got so many folks uh, sitting down and are probably quite hungry and want to get fed, in true Islamic fashion, we're normally separated by the sex. Men one side, women the other side, and normally it's the men that go first, but in my culture at least, we allow the women to go first. So maybe if I start off with this table, 
if you guys can come on round and then we'll follow through on the next couple of tables. Okay, and then while you're coming and getting your, oh, hang on, hang on, I, you see I'm new at this game. Um, thanks Lori for reminding me. We have a proclamation that our group took, put together and our group being Salam, so um, Salam means standing alongside America's Muslims. It's a local ad hoc group. We don't even have NGO status, it's just a bunch of us liberal do-gooders as we are so many of in Missoula, Montana. Nothing else to do in our spare time. Play soccer, run, fish, hike, and do good causes. Um, so anyway, um, we're going to read you a proclamation and the ones that are going to come read it is going to be Lucia, Clem, Chelsea, Brittany, and Lori. Whereas there is an alarming escalation of national and local incidents and rhetoric directed against people of the Muslim faith. Whereas we are Americans who value freedom of religion and want to create a positive environment where we can learn from each other's faiths. Whereas Missoula has a long history of embracing diversity and dignity for all people by statute and practice. Whereas we believe that open dialogue that doesn't demonize any side is critical to address the fears and concerns that exist. Whereas we want our community to be a place where all people, including Muslims, feel welcome and appreciated, we proclaim this week, April 25th and 230th, to be Celebrate Islam Week in Missoula, Montana, a week of learning and dialogue, understanding and celebration and of the Islamic heritage of our Muslim citizens, friends, and visitors. And we invite the people of our city and county and region to participate in a series of events aimed at sharing information about Islam and building positive relationships among us. Before you or we dine, I invite you to pray with me. Let us pray. God of all people, of community, of love, we give you thanks for bringing us here tonight to celebrate one another's culture, especially lifting up and learning about Islam tonight. May we all have open hearts and open minds so we may greet one another in love and kindness, and we may walk as one community of humanity. Giving God thanks and praise this day and always, we say amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. So I think we can get started with the food and in typical Islamic fashion before we all eat, we always just say Bismillah. So come on, first table over and get started. And while you're getting your food, I can go over the rest of the stuff I need to talk about. Um, there's a couple of posters on the front table that you all walk by. So there's this poster here that talks about this the whole week's worth of activities. Um, in case you didn't get it from me, you can just pick up one of these posters. Um, it also talks about the website that you can get to. Um, we have a Facebook site. There's a little poster here that Clem very cleverly designed. It would have to take a journalism professor to put one of those together. Um, but basically, you put it in front of you like that, take a selfie, and post it on Twitter, uh, Facebook, I guess Instagram. So any of the three trending social media groups. You can tell how old I am since I, all I use is Facebook. I've never tweeted and I've never Instagrammed, so no idea what the hell those things are. <laughs> Facebook is about as far as I've gotten. Um, I would like to recognize the Salam group, the ad hoc group that I've been talking about, that I've been 
working so hard for the last several weeks to put this all together. Um, it is comprised of Lori Franklin, Clem Work, John Lund, Eamon Olmset, Betsy Mulligan-Daig, and the Jeanette Rankin Peace Center, Brittany Christensen, Samir Bitar, Chelsea Porter, Brendan Work, Lucia Solorzano Work, boy, I love that name. That is quite a name. Uh, Jason Nicholson, Chris Floor, Jesse Jager, Daniel Dish, Eileen Brown, Judy Wellett, Casey Dunning, and the Missoula Interfaith Collaborative. Salim Matt Grass, who is actually going to be heading up the Sufi dance on Saturday. Jenny Mish, and tonight's volunteers who are serving the food and helping out in various other capacities. Thank you so much. Um, a little bit of uh, housekeeping duties. I would love to thank the St. Paul's Lutheran Church for the use of their facilities. It's been really difficult to find a spot that would host as many as we thought were going to come here and also to be able to serve food. So, um, And also some place that we wouldn't have to pay an arm and a leg since we were trying to keep this free. So thank you so much for the Lutheran Church for your to the Lutheran Church for the use of their premises. Some other little facts, since we are down in the basement, the exits are quite clearly marked. Bathrooms, there's signs, there's background to my right. Um, there is an elevator for those who need to use it at the back. Um, so tonight's events are going to feature four speakers. The format's pretty much going to be about 10 minutes of time for each person to be able to present their information, followed by five minutes of question and answer. Uh, Betsy Mulligan will kind of keep track of who's presenting and keep track of the time so that we're not going over. At the end of the five minute time mark, the next person who's up will kind of come up and speak. So if you have a burning question that you didn't have time to get asked, there are cards at each one of your tables. If you don't mind, just go ahead and jot down what your question is. And at the end of all four presenters, we will have time for more question and answer session. So there will be time right at the end in case you didn't have time to get your question in. The four presenters we have tonight are going to be Wuri uh, Kuru, Kuru Mastudi, Kusu Mastudi. She's an Indonesian woman who's here as a graduate student and also teaching um, Indonesian language in the Defense Critical Language Program. She's going to be talking about Indonesian women and Islam uh, and how that interacts with Islamic culture, followed by Hanan. Anan is a Saudi Arabian student, graduate student here doing a PhD. She's going to present a short work on um, the meaning of, of Allahu Akbar. So that's kind of a hot topic right now. What does it mean? There's many misinterpretations of that. That will be followed by Julian Adler. He's an American student at UN. Um, Julian, are you a junior or a senior now? Super senior, oh boy. These guys who can never just figure out how to graduate in four years, they need a fifth year. Um, so he had a wonderful semester abroad in Morocco and uh, took quite a few classes, so he's gonna talk about the interaction or the, the parallels or the exchange between Muslim theology and Christian theology. So there'll be some parallels that he'll talk about and how the two have interacted over the, you see that'll be about 13 centuries of our two religions crossing paths. So everyone's talking about Islam now like as if it's a new phenomenon, but Islam and Christianity have been together for 13 centuries. If they could live together back then, I don't see why we can't do it now. Um, and then the fourth presenter is myself. So I will be talking about ISIS. It's another hot topic, and I'll be talking about what is it, where did it come from, 
its theology and how it differs from standard Islamic belief. Um, rules of engagement. Just briefly talk about that. We're here to be open to questions. Tonight you don't have to write down your questions in order to get them asked. You can stand up and shout them out at me. If you're away at the back, I might not be able to hear it, so we might have to have some way of getting the questions presented so that the speakers can hear it. We ask simply that you keep your questions short, civil, and polite. Um, no one's here to get into a fight or a debate. We're here to be open. Uh, certainly ask any tough questions you have. We're not shy of tough questions. Just don't need to be rude about it. Uh, there's also rules of conduct being posted to the front door and probably one at each table. Just as a reminder, please do follow the rules. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that the speakers who are here tonight are not professional speakers. None of us are professors in Islam or Imams or have tremendous scholarly thought and written books or anything else like that. We're just, we're just laymen trying to do the best job we can in order to try and educate you guys to the best of our ability. So there might be questions that we're going to be stumped at. In, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely positive that we will be stumped by some of the questions that you guys ask. So we might have to actually uh, lean to some more experts who are part of the audience to answer some of those, but we'll do our best. All of the food tonight was from the India Curry House, which is on Broadway, just across from the MCT Theater. We thank them for providing us the food. The whole idea of that was to be a little bit more ethnic tonight. I mean, you can't come to an Islamic presentation and get hot dogs and burgers, can you? Um, while we're eating also, we have someone on the piano that did play before. And maybe after he's finished his food, we can entice him to play while the rest of the audience gets their, their food and settles down. So once everyone's kind of gotten their food, we will actually start our presentation. But Asaf Adonai is the pianist, and he's going to regale us in some of the things that he's got tonight. Thanks. So while you guys finish off your meal or come get cookies and stuff, I'm, I'm just going to go over the ground rules again. Um, Ten minutes allowance for each presenter, followed by five minutes question and answer. Betsy's going to just keep time and help direct the questions at the presenter so that we keep them kind of in order. The panelist order was Wuri. Wuri, you're going to be up first. <laughs> Hi! <laughs> um, okay, I'm Wuri, so if it is difficult for you to say my name, just remember, don't worry, be Wuri. Don't worry, be Wuri. Okay, I'm from Indonesia, so if you are mistaken me from Middle East, if I am Indonesia, in Indonesia and people mistaken me as a Middle Eastern, I will be really proud because it means that I'm beautiful. But if in here people like uh, misrecognize me as Middle Eastern, I just care, I don't know why, because I'm Asian. Okay, I'm Indonesian, so in case you do not know where Indonesia is, I am under, I do understand that because it is not really popular country. Yeah, so um, here is America and I come from this country. So uh, it is upper side of Australia and bottom down of Malaysia. So some people just meet speaking me as Malaysia. I am okay with that because we come from the same ethnicity, but Actually, I come from Indonesia, especially this island. So Indonesia have like 
Thousand Island. I come from this island, the main island in Indonesia, which is Java. It's not the biggest one, but most people live there. Okay. So, how is Islam in Indonesia? Well, I believe that most of you think that Islam, like most Muslim in the world, living in Middle East, but actually, Indonesia is the biggest. Muslim populations in the world like 20% of Muslim in the world is in Indonesia and it's a, it's about 87% of Indonesian are Muslim But why you are not popular? I mean, but why none of media like? You know spotting your country to see whether there is a terrorism there or not because We are actually democratic country people say that this is secular country because in my country we uphold sex religion and Muslim is the most um, like the most popular population there but we also believe in Christianity uh, Buddhism Hinduism and Confucius from China that's why I think we're not that popular but I don't know <laughs> so like what I said before, Islam came to Indonesia in 30th century. But at that time, it is not Indonesia yet, because we were like up, um, we, we just, uh, in the, we just independence in 90s, uh, in 20th century. So at that time, it was just a kingdom in Asian Pacific and Islam came there. And in 17th century, Western come there. So that's the time Christianity come to Indonesia. At that time, people just accept and religions come and try to assimilate with the culture. And Islam is the, the religion that easily assimilate to their culture. That's why if you come to Indonesia, not all people in Indonesia wearing hijab because they are trying to assimilate their religions and also the culture there. And Indonesian culture is not wearing hijab. But some people wearing hijab too because this is a part of their expression to show their religion belief. Okay, so why a Muslim woman use hijab actually? I believe that in the other uh, holy books, they also, um, you know, a saying or a law or something that talk to people to use hijab for the woman. And one of them, also Islam, they encourage women to wear hijab. But this is kind of like encouraging. The most important thing you are wearing hijab is when you are praying. It is five times a day. So I believe although people like Muslim not wear a hijab in public area, but when they are praying, they will use hijab. For me, myself, why I use hijab? Because I was born Muslim and I don't know, I just get used to it with this. So this is a kind of, you know, modest uh, clothes that I use. And I also do not want to bother myself to find hijab to pray. So by using this kind of attire, I can just, you know, the time to pray, I just pray. So I do not need to find hijab, but some people do not really convenient using this kind of attire. So they save hijab in this in their in their usually in their bag, and they will pray using hijab. So basically, a woman in Islam encouraged to use hijab based on my understanding is when they are praying. So it's not necessarily they have to use hijab every time. That's what I understand. Okay. That's why in Indonesia, people just like this. It is, when they're working, they look like this. But when they are praying, everyone use this kind of hijab. And based on my observation so far, I, I was living in Indonesia in 2012. And what I observe is that people who use this kind of attire when they are praying, it's only Indonesian and Malaysian. Other people just use, you know, their attire they use that, that time and pray. But in Indonesia, we have this kind of attire, we call it ruku. So it's kind of like a very long hijab to pray. Yeah. And the first time I came here, I was praying uh, in Muslim Student Association home. 
and people just look at me because I've already used hijab and I also use this kind of attire. I thought it's it just you know I just used to use this kind of things and one of my friends said, Oh you can just pray with those kind of attire. I know but I feel convenient using these things because in my country everyone used this kind of hijab to pray. So even if you've already used hijab like this, you still use this kind of hijab. Or we call it ruku or baju kurung, I think. In Malaysia okay so some people ask me Woody why you still use hijab when you are in America it is I think it's a symbol of oppression in some country and I say no this is not symbol of oppression in Indonesia this is symbol of freedom and feminism from Indonesian people because in 1966 until 1998 you can you are not allowed to wear hijab in a public places even if you are muslim you are not allowed to wear hijab in a public places so it was abandoned since 1982 because the government afraid that there is a separation between separatism between islam and the other religion in fact we are just you know trying to um uh, uh, trying to do what we believe in and trying to express what we believe in but at that time Indonesia is not a democratic country we are under the military oppressions at that time so the government and the people there are military people so they want to have a uniformity in the country so it is not allowed to show that you are Christians or you're Muslim or you're Hindu in a public places you need to say that you're Indonesian because that's the way of government to you know encourage nationalism in in a country because it was a very I don't know at that time I think it was a very okay <laughs> it was a very you know crucial time where the government try the government tried to change the I, the government system. I don't know how to say that. Okay, and then in 1984, there is a huge protest of Muslim people. Some students, they are, even if they are not allowed to use hijab in the public places, they just go to school and wear hijab. And what happened at that time? People are arrested. They went to jail, and some of them just lost. You know, we don't know where where they where they where they lost. They just do not come home, or even their bodies not come home, so they were just lost at that time. So, um, and uh, the Muslim people at that time trying to find a way how to use hijab in a public places. They do like you know protest, at, and then I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> there are a lot of things to do. Like, like for example, my mother. They are trying to have a discussions with the government and also try to merge the law at that time in order to you know uphold their religious belief and then in 1991 finally the student in public school allowed to use hijab but the teacher are not <laughs> so the teacher can use hijab freely in 1998 when the president is changing and also the government system is changing because uh, they said that if you are the civil servant, you need to follow any civil uh, any civil regulations. One of them is being nationalism. Being nationalism meaning you are not allowed to show your religion. It's not only Islam but also the other religion. And then for police women, it's just the newest one in 2015. They are allowed to wear hijab. Before that, they just need to be modest as this. But now, if you want to wear hijab, you have this kind of attire. But if you do not want to wear hijab, you know, just wear this kind of attire. So it's kind of refer reform of the people in Indonesia. Wearing hijab means showing that you are freedom to choose whether you are going to show you are Muslim or you are not. Okay. Because the time is up, so. <laughs>
about Aceh. Aceh is one of the province in Indonesia and they uphold the Sharia law. So in Aceh, every woman who are Muslim have to use hijab. I don't have any comment about that, but people there say okay. But then in military people, Nowadays, they are not allowed to wear hijab or showing their religion still. We're still trying to give them freedom and also choice whether or not they can use hijab, but it's not yet there. And one of the big uh, movement in Indonesia is that now hijab is a very huge business where most, it's also empower women to, to be more independent, not only rely on to the men. So nowadays, it is really common for women just open their business to sell hijab because now hijab is something free to use in a public places. That's why when people ask me, why you still hijab, uh, use hijab in America? Because this is a free country, so I wanna, uh, I wanna show that I also free whether or not I will use hijab. Some people have said I will put off my hijab, but that's my right to choose whether or not I wanna show people that I'm Muslim, so. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to say. Thank you, Lori. If there's any questions? Yeah, go ahead. in hijab and there are so many boutique that sell a very fashionable clothes in hijab so some people who are not Muslim also using hijab because I don't know one of my friends she is Christian and she said that well in my Bible they also ask people to use hijab actually so it is not only Muslim attire but this is also Christian attire so people say like oh okay so just wear hijab everywhere you want because now you have a choice to wear a nap Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Uri. I know more than I ever wanted to about your job. <laughs> uh, but it is important to realize that how a lot of feminists think that wearing the hijab means that women in Islam are being oppressed. And I guess there are some countries where that is actually true if you were to ask a lot of the women in Iran and Afghanistan they would definitely agree with that um, but there's also many countries where you have the freedom to wear it or not to wear it and I think that to me is a better better scenario hi there um, my name is Julian I'm a philosophy and political science double major at the University of Montana uh, and uh, I, I came across uh, Islamic theology um, or Kalam, while I was studying in Al Maghreb in, in Morocco, um, there's a professor named Saeed Nahid. Uh, he taught a, cla a basic class on religion, and uh, being a philosophy major, I, I pestered him about the philosophy of Islam incessantly until he finally gave me a book about it and told me to be on my way. Um, so, this is just a, a short introduction to uh, the way that. Uh, Christianity and Islam have interacted. Um, there are certain parallels in, in, in theology uh, that go all the way back to the formation of religion. Um, of course, uh, Islam, uh, Judaism, and Christianity are, are all religions of the book. Um, and they're all based on, 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 the, on the same God, uh, going back to Judaism. Um, but uh, they, they, they're also influenced by um, different philosophies and theologies that, that, have, that have crept into their discourse and their culture. Um, and because we are people, they have been influenced in similar ways and influenced each other. So beginning at the beginning, uh, the origins of religious doctrine. Um, let's see, maybe I can just... There we go. Uh, so... Many Zoroastrianism, Judaism, and the Persian Empire. Uh, Islam was a, a relatively late comer on the scene of monotheistic religions. Uh, Christianity and Judaism were both well established. 
um, before Muhammad came with uh, the Quran that was revealed to him um, by uh, Allah um, or the Messenger of Allah. Uh, however, being religions of the book and being monotheistic religions, they all share some very similar traits, and they can and we can trace a lot of their their root structure back to. Um, Back to a few basic precepts. Um, the the lineage is is a uh, Juda Judaic or uh, Judeo Christian, um, and they actually share some some very interesting. One, two, three. They, they 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 share some very interesting parallels. Christian Christianity and Islam do. Um, the injection of Manichaeism into Christianity via Saint Augustine of Hi Saint Augustine of Hippo parallels closely the injection of Zoroastrian ideals into Islam in the form of Shiism. Now, you might just wonder what Manichaeism is. If you've read Saint Augustine, he uh, he's he's rather virulently opposed to it, um, as only a convert to Christianity could be. Um, but Many way back then, way back when, also caused quite a bit of trouble for the Zoroastrians. It's from him that we get the idea that the spirit is eternal and pure, and that the physical world is not. Um, this idea crept into uh, Judaism of the time, it crept into Zoroastrianism of the time, and eventually made its way into Islam, giving, giving all three religions, or all four religions, um, a, a pretty good base uh, in, in, in dualism, in, in spirit and soul. Um, whether or not this was orga ordained by God, I will leave up to you guys. Um, so, Manichaeism, and especially it, its, its theology and, and the, the ideas of Mani, um, creep into Christianity via St. Saint Saint Augustine. Um, Islam has a similar path. Uh, Zoroastrian ideals in Islam uh, came in when... Uh, huh, uh, came in uh, sometime after the Rashidun Caliphate, um, and it's a, it's a very long history. Uh, but, um, just like Man Mani made his way into, into the Christian religion uh, via Augustine of Hippo, Hippo um, Zoroastrian ideals came into Islam uh, under the guise of Shiism, when the Rashidun Caliphs figured out the, the Rashidun caliphs, caliphs are the, the three original caliphs, um, and when, when, when they figured out that they, they had to have a structure to rule this vast empire that they had been given by the grace of Allah, um, and the only people that had that structure were the people they just conquered, the Persians, uh, being learned and being very into their culture, uh, the Persians uh, used Shiism uh, kind of as a way to free themselves from the political dictate of Islam. Uh, much like Augustine of, of Hippo used uh, his, his, his theology and, and his ideal of God. Five minutes. Um, okay, uh, the rise... <coughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, the rise of theology. The, the, Nestori the Nestorians, Kosros, Justinian, and Bait al-Hikmah. Um, theology in Islam and Christianity actually both developed in very similar ways. Uh, both of them came about from the destruction or the displacement of people who had knowledge of the Greeks. Um, in the case of Islam, uh, the Nestorians were chased from the Byzantine Empire by Justinian uh, when he imposed strict religious reforms and they brought with them Greek philosophy. Um, Khosros of the Persian Empire let them live there until the Muslims eventually caused, uh, conquered the Pers Persian Empire um, and philosophy uh, crept into the, the Islamic discourse. Um, similarly, the sack of Constantinople uh, is a, and, and, and uh, also the bite of Hikmah. Sorry, I'm a, I'm a little bit tired. It's essay season. Um, in any case, what, what Islam and Christianity both have in common is that their theology is both influenced by the introduction of Greek philosophy and people starting to wonder um, if they can apply logic to their religious doctrines. And uh, surprise, surprise, of course they could. Um, Aristotle, and this is a bust of Aristotle from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, uh, had a few basic questions about existence, epistemology, um, and uh, metaphysics, uh, and a few basic ideas. 
uh, his idea was that uh, the universe, long story short, um, he used the infinity, he, he used the, one, two, three, four, five. Um, long story short, uh, he had this idea that cause must have effect, and effect must have, have cause. In order for something to come into existence, there must be some, something that causes it to come into existence. Um, if I kick a ball, that, that ball moves, but I had to be around somehow to kick that ball first. You know, the, the cause of my existence is my mother, the cause of the ball moving is me kicking it. Um, Aristotle said that this can't go on and ad infinitum. It can't go on back into forever, re regressing for eternity. It must have some starting point. And his starting point was the eternal. Um, later, the eternal would be interpreted to be God, most notably by Ibn Sina. Uh, Ibn Sina uh, was influenced by Al-Farabi, who translated Aristotle's works. Uh, and he's one of the one of the first and foremost uh, philosophers in in, in Islam. Uh, he's the one who took Aristotle's argument that existence can't go back ad infinitum; that there must be some source of cause and effect, and applied it to the eternity of God. Um, he saw God as necessary, and he saw God as unitary something that exists without needing something else to cause its existence. Uh, this would later take its way into the proofs of God used by St. Thomas Aquinas, um, who lived from 1225 to 1274. Uh, as far as it goes, uh, there was a thriving, there, 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 there's, there's been a history, <coughs> essay season, am I right? Um, there, there, there's a long history of the ideas of the Greeks making their way through um, the Byzantine Empire, being translated to the Arabs, and then given back to Christianity. Um, and this is where the theology develops. Um, like all other religions, they, they, they shared... Um, they, they shared basic philosophical ideas with each other that still uh, resonate with us today. Um, that's pretty much it for my presentation. I'm sorry it wasn't that terribly eloquent. Um, but if you guys have any questions, I'm much more eloquent when I have something, some direction to go on. Questions? One here? What is the name of the book that the professor gave you? Um, the, the History of Islamic Philosophy uh, by Al-Fakhri. Might have to script it. Uh, <laughs> Alif Lam Fa Alif Ya. But A L F A K H. Why? <laughs> um, it, it actually has a whole lot better explanation of the things that I've just talked about. Um, the basic point that I wanted to make in all of this is that being humans, a lot of philosophy ends up turning out quite the same way. When we ask the question why something happens, we tend to think along similar lines, and we influence each other when good ideas come up. And so when Ibn Sina saw what Aristotle had done, Without the use of God, he adapted it to the Christian uh, to, to to Islam at the time, and the same holds true of Aquinas. When he saw what Ibn Sina had done with Aristotle, and what Al Farabi had done with Aristotle, he adapted it to Christianity. Ideas are reborn in the forms of their time, and Islam is no different. Christianity and Islam both experienced the same enlightenment and awakening, whether that was the Renaissance or the rise of the Bayt al-Hikmah under the Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, they both experienced similar declines and repression under other regimes and rules. Uh, theology bloomed and blossomed for periods, and it was repressed for long periods. Both churches have had histories of both enlightenment and, to a certain extent, repression. Um, 
It's interesting to note that today, the gates of ishtihad in Islam, or the idea of interpreting Islam based upon logic and your own experience, are closed. Whereas the gates of ishtihad in Christianity today seem very much open. Uh, we shouldn't judge other religions based upon how they see ideas and, and, the way, and, and, and the way ideas influence each other, because at some time, at some point, every single religion has had every single view of every single idea. Uh, and that doesn't diminish the value of the religion. Uh, when we talk about Mani, and I will finish with my little tirade soon, um, new ideas are always being injected each time uh, into the theology and into the philosophy of different religions. Uh, Mani injected the idea of dualism that would eventually, eventually um, influence Descartes um, and launch philosophy. In the same way, Muhammad introduced the idea of unity that would bring about uh, <clears throat> Sufi Islam, uh, poetry of the highest caliber, and philosophy that would eventually um, make its way into Spinoza's dialogues, make its way into um, monadology uh, of Leibniz, uh, and, and influence us to think of the world a little bit differently than our dualistic system had before. Um, so when we look at theology in Islam and theology in um, Christianity, you can see some very stark and interesting parallels, which I, me I meant to point out in my lecture, but I got a little bit nervous. <laughs> okay, well, thank you all very much. Um, what is Sufi Islam, and what is its relationship to uh, Sunni and Shia? Uh, Sufi, okay. Um, Sufi Islam exists in both Sunni and Shiite uh, traditions, and thanks in part to this guy named Al Ghazali. Uh, he was a religious scholar who said that in addition to understanding God from the Hadith and the Surah and the Quran, or the, the sayings of the Prophet, the life of the Prophet, and the writings of God via the Prophet, one must, under, one must be able to understand God on a deeper, more personal level. Um, a mystic level, if you will. This actually comes from bhakti uh, in Hinduism, where people would write poetry to, to, to Krishna um, or, to Sh or to Shiva, um, Vaishnavas and Vaishnavas, uh, and, and this poetry would be almost erotic in nature because you would picture yourself as being a part of God, and God being a part of you, and a kind of love that could never be made perfectly or simple. Um, Sufis reimagines this relationship with God as a mystical relationship. What the Quran, and the Surat, and the Hadith, and the Sirah uh, do is they give examples of how you should live, but they don't give examples of how you should feel how you should experience. And the Sufis brought this experience into Islam. And Al-Ghazali stopped them from being persecuted because he realized that philosophy and logic and jurisprudence can only take you so far in your religion. You have to have a personal connection with Allah as much as you have to have an active connection with Allah. Um, and so philosophy plays a very subliminal and interesting role in the development of Islam as well as the development of Christianity. Uh, Sufi Islam itself is separate and a part of the larger Muslim tradition. Uh, one single way of viewing God um, in relation to yourself and the world. Interestingly enough, uh, Protestantism also started viewing God in this way too, although probably not quite as viscerally as either Sufi Islam or Bhakti did. Uh, the poet Habib, uh, a Sufi poet, actually I took his name for my Arabic class with Ustad Sumir, um, had some, some poems to God in, in, in which he would drink of God's wine, which is, alcohol is actually forbidden in Islam, but wine is a metaphor for love for God and the intoxication that you feel when you approach the eternal truth of the one thing that is all things. Uh, again, taking from Hinduism and Bhakti, 
uh, is permitted because it's a feeling that you get from the divine. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that we can twist logic, but there are very few ways that we can twist meaning. Um, and so that's kind of what Sufism is and how it connects to context and how it all connects to philosophy. <laughs> All right, thank you, Julian. Now you know why he's a fifth year senior. <laughs> you guys could understand half of that, you're way ahead of me. Um, now let's see if we can get technology working. Julian actually did introduce a fairly good topic about Sufism, which I hope I will touch upon here also. So I'm going to talk a bit about ISIS, which everyone knows about, hears about, sees on the media, and uh, folks are all upset about it, but maybe I can shed some actual light on the whole topic. Um, falling a little bit on from where Julian was talking about, this is a map of the spread of Islam. The darker red-brown color is when the Prophet Muhammad actually started Islam. Um, and left about 620, 630 AD. And the light brown shows the uh, extent after the first century. Um, and the purple is about where the Umayyad Caliphate actually ended up. The arrow showing the, the spread of Islam coming out of Mecca and Medina. Uh, it was spread both ways through armies, through uh, Con conquest uh, both militarily and by the spread of the word. So basically people would be going out, spreading the word of Islam, uh, people would be either fascinated by it and convert, um, there was also wars, so uh, those two things did happen. But when ISIS talks about the caliphate, this is the caliphate that they're talking about. This is the glory years of Islam. This is kind of when it was at its peak, it was spreading, it was powerful, Europe was afraid of it, um, and um, that's the image that they're trying to portray to the folks that they're trying to attract, that uh, we're trying to get back to that caliphate. It's historical, it's an image that every Islam has, every Muslim person has, so it's an easy one for most Muslims to relate to. But by the same time, it gives a different connotation to Westerners about what the caliphate is, maybe it gives a negative connotation. The current map of the Islamic world, everything shown in light green are the Sunni Muslims, the darker green are the Shia Muslims. That's the two main sects, it's kind of like Protestants and Catholics. Um, but it also shows the extent of how Islam is spread out. Now this is where Islam is in the majority. Uh, you've got also several countries where Islam is in the minority, like in China. You know, you could probably see there on that map where, they, sorry, see the pointer. There's a good section of China which is actually uh, Muslim. Um, kind of gives you the expanse and the extent of the Islamic world. Now, just even taking a, a quick look at that map, see how many countries there in the Islamic world right now are stable, progressive, doing e economically well right now. It's probably only half of them. The rest of them are all in a state of turmoil, civil war, not doing so well economically. There's only about half or less than half of those countries which are really doing well. So where did we start off? I mean, there was the whole Islamic empire. It slowly collapsed. Um, the colonial, the European colonial powers came out through Europe, conquered a lot of the Muslim world there. You can see anything from the Spanish, the French, the Italian, the Egypt, the British, Don British. Uh, what you're seeing on the ends there is the remnant of the, did it again? The Persian Empire. You can see what's left of it after the Persian Empire was also so big. There's a green outline that you can see. That was the height of the Ottoman, the Turkish Empire. So after the regular Muslim Empire, the Turks who were also Muslim, then were the last of the big Muslim empire. And when that waned, you can see how the European powers came on. And that pretty much 
was a major blow to most Muslim people, knowing that they've been conquered, they're now living under colonialism. So First World War came, Second World War came. After the Second World War, you could start seeing a lot of these countries start getting away from colonialism, start becoming national, independent countries. I'm just going to take a brief example here of Egypt from left to right, your left to right, uh, Gam al Nasser, Anwar Sadat, and then Hosni Mubarak. Nasser took over for, from a monarchy, there was a military coup, he took over an old Egyptian monarchy and really created what is now known as the modern Egypt. It was nationalistic, very little influenced by Islam. Islam was not really even talked about. The whole feeling in the Middle East was, we lost to these damn Europeans because of holding on to Islam. Islam had not really given them the strength that they wanted. They saw the power of the European armies and they were very eager to nationalize and catch up education, economic, militarily to the Europeans. They didn't want to be conquered again. Islam was holding them back. If you look at that same time, Turkey, Ataturk. Ataturk was very strong. He was saying, you guys are going to cut off your beards. You're shaving off your beards. I want no reference back to Islam. We're going to nationalize. We're going to modernize. We're going to catch up with the West. And he was on a very aggressive schedule. Some of these other countries were trying to do the same thing on a less aggressive schedule, but that was what was going on across most of the uh, Muslim countries. Sadat came over, carried on the same thing. Hosni Mubarak, you all know about um, the problem with some of these presidents were that they were almost mini dictators. They were so adamant about trying to get the power squash opposition because we're on an agenda. We, are, we have an aggressive path to follow to catch up with the Europeans uh, and the West. So how do we do that? You can't do that if people are opposing you and asking you questions at every step. Why are we doing this? Why aren't we doing it another way? We want to get on, get on in a hurry. So unfortunately, as you see this progression of the presidents, they became more and more tyrannical and oppressive. They were not giving much chance to the opposition in the countries to uh, gain a foothold. Said Qutb is one of those that was actually friends with Nasser at the time that the National Party was being created. Uh, they were good friends. But Said Qutb, he's an educated person in Egypt. He was a teacher, came over to the United States, was educated at uh, what is now known as the Northern Colorado in uh, Greeley. Uh, traveled also over to Stanford, saw the West, was appalled by what he saw here in the West. Drugs, alcohol, mixing of sexes, music, you know, you name it, the standard things that um, we even rail up about right now, right? I mean, there's this dichotomy right now going on in this country between the progressives and the ones that want more Christian uh, theology and the lifestyle that that uh, brought about or, or should bring about. So uh, Said Qutb was an author of about 24 books. So he, he is a learned man. He's the one that really started the whole thing about how do we get back to an Islamic-based country? How do we infuse and infuse Islam? Not just on a religious basis, but as a nation, how do we develop a country based upon Islamic values? So all of the time that we had the big caliphates, the Islamic empires, Sharia law, education, astronomy, mathematics, mathematics, physics, you know, poetry, music. These are all being developed at a very high level. Mm -hmm. At the height of the Islamic empire, the Islamic world was way ahead of the Europeans, way, way ahead. They even had developed in, in, indoor plumbing and sewers at the time that Europeans were still crapping in a bucket and throwing it out the window, <laughs> literally. So. But after, after that, the Islamic world declined. And so went the whole progression of thought, philosophy, mathematics, and the development of Sharia law. It kind of stagnated. Mm -hmm. Said Qutb said, we want to get back there. Because if we get back there, we will get back to the height of the glory of the Islamic empire that we were. He was not an anti-West person per se, not really a violent person, but he wanted more of the Islamic theology brought back in. Uh, but unfortunately, he was also um, kind of swindled out of being a part of the government by Nasser. Uh, Nasser what nothing, nothing at all to do with Islam as part of the governmental process. Nasser was a nationalist, 
He wanted a secular government, so it could have felt betrayed. And uh, he wanted to get Nasser out, for which uh, wonderful effect he was thrown in jail and killed. In 1966, he was hung. But during his time in prison, he was also uh, took under his wing a lot of people, and chief among them, Iman al-Zawahri, a person you will know as being the second in command of al-Qaeda. Uh, Qutb's brother immigrated to Saudi Arabia, and a classmate of his was Osama bin Laden. So you see how the web connects. Here comes the Shah of Iran. He's now the ruler of uh, Iran, an old monarchy, uh, quite well loved, but again, quite uh, autocratic, was not willing to allow opposition, started clamping down on all that. And what happened to him? Here comes Ayatollah Khomeini, a very, very learned scholar. He's written many, many books, a theologian, very well respected in his country and across the Shia world. Um, and he was calling out the Shah on a lot of his reforms, saying, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. And ended up publicly, publicly protesting and called the Shah at one point a wretched, miserable man. The Shah was instituting all kinds of uh, reforms. He was converting public lands to private enterprises, giving off gifts to probably his followers, not the general public, um, clamping down on Islam. So Ayatollah Khomeini kind of called him out on that, for which he was sent into exile. So he spent 14 years in exile in Najaf in Iraq, which is right across the border. It's in the part of Shia Iraq. He was in exile there until finally the government of Iraq said, you know, Iran's right, our neighbor here, you're making too much noise, we're feeling un uncomfortable, you need to leave. The person who gave him that message at that time was Vice President Saddam Hussein, telling the Ayatollah to leave. Again, you can start seeing connections. This whole place is all connected. Today's friend becomes tomorrow's enemy. Tomorrow, yesterday's enemy becomes my friend. Things change, and it's very fluent. He was sent off to Paris within a year. There were so many public protests in Iran going on that the Shah had to leave. He left. Ayatollah flew in. I think every one of you has seen those images on public TV of how he was welcomed. He instituted Sharia law. Uh, clerics are the ones that he felt were necessary because they were the ones educated in Islamic theology. He just didn't want every any lay person to be the judge. He wanted people who were uh, learned in theology. And I'm probably going to run out of time, but I'm I'm going to beg for, for forgiveness. Um, but the reason why he's here is because this is the first country that used Islamic religion to overthrow a whole country and instituted Sharia law. Bin Laden and Iman al-Zawari founded Al-Qaeda in 18, 1988. Uh, both of them had contacts with Sayyid Qutb. They read his books. They saw the overthrow of, uh, of uh, the Shah by Khomeini, and that was a really powerful visual thing that they saw. Um, you all know that bin Laden then went on into Afghanistan and helped uh, fight the Russians. And, and that whole experience of 10 years really solidified his whole thing that we as a Muslim nation can overthrow a superpower, Russia. Russia was a superpower. And that gave him a, a ton of confidence. But Al-Qaeda was also convinced that there's this Christian-Jewish alliance that's out to destroy Islam. And of course, he then spread his whole message and violence to other parts, which led, of course, to 9-11, 2001, 3,000 killed, up to 6,000 wounded. This was the big thing that hit the world that Al-Qaeda is here. And we have to come to grips with it. Before that, there was smaller, smaller attacks. Uh, yes, we knew about them, but nothing of this scale. And of course, what happened after that was, here comes my favorite president, George Bush, his war on terror, and his famous declaration, either you're with us or you are with a terrorist. You'll see in another one of my slides where ISIS kind of takes that same message and uses that as part of their message to recruit. Um, Bush also had his Bush Doctrine that the U.S. can wage preemptive war against terrorists. 
or countries harboring them, when he made that threat, everyone in that Middle East region was shaking. Mm -hmm. Pakistan was shaking. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan was saying, okay, well, Taliban are here. Come on in. That's what Al-Qaeda wanted. They wanted the U.S. troops to come in there. That's what Al-Qaeda wanted. Iran was nervous, so was a lot of the other countries. And so when the U.S. went into Afghanistan, there was very little uh, opposition, which then, of course, later became more and more, and we're still bogged down there. But when Bush changed and focused on Iraq in 2003, uh, he, accusing Saddam Hussein of having those weapons of mass destruction, of which none were ever found and still haven't been found, you know, um, that changed the whole the whole tone of this conversation. Saddam Hussein at that time, he, this guy is not a known religious person. He, religion probably meant nothing to him. You know, This is a nationalist, socialist kind of a guy. Uh, yeah, religion probably because he grew up in Islam, he's in an Islamic country, but really this guy's not a jihadi, he's not a, he's not a five times a day prayer guy, this guy's drinking alcohol, listening to music, all that kind of stuff. So, you know, uh, here we come in, we throw him out, um, and in that the American troops go in, right? At the beginning it's really very easy, they're in the Shia South area who are welcoming the U.S. guys, and then they get into Baghdad and slowly take over, uh, and then they hit a fairly fierce resistance then from the Sunnis. Not at first, it kind of slowly happened, it, and you all remember the Sunni Triangle, which is mm -hmm. shown up there. Fallujah, Ramadi, Tikrit, and Damascus, right? That's the Sunni stronghold. And after the U.S. had formed the government with Nuri al-Maliki, who is a Shia, uh, there's no way that the Shia were going to let a Sunni take over after all they had endured under Saddam Hussein. Um, the Sunnis felt kind of disenfranchised, right? Here they were rulers of this country. And now the Shias, the bloody Shias, have come over and taken over, and we've been given no part of this. They were really u upset. Uh, they were waiting, waiting for their chance to be part of government. It really didn't happen in a very strong fashion. So the, the Sunni tribal areas are the ones that you will see again and again in, in the ISIS folks, in the Al-Qaeda folks, because they probably feel that they've got nowhere else to go, right or wrong. Uh, there's always. Yes, they can always come back and get, be, a, be a part of it, but there's, the folks that fought for Saddam Hussein in the army were defeated and went underground and are trying to resurrect this caliphate. They're the ones who are mostly behind the, is in the insurgency. So the insurgency started off loosely, then it became more coalesced. Uh, Al-Qaeda gave them an umbrella. It became known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and then later on it morphed into ISI, Islamic State, in Iraq. October 2006 is the first time we see that. There's a series of uh, successive folks. You, you remember quite well uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi there on the left. You've seen lots of pictures of him. When he was taken out, there's two more leaders. And now finally what we have is Abu Bakr al-Baghdad. He's the current leader of ISIL Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, which then morphed into Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. And then he declares himself caliphate. And the, the place that they have now called the Caliphate in June 2014. So um, they're playing on a lot of words, the Caliphate, him being called a Caliph. I mean, a Caliph back then was the ruler of the whole Islamic world. And this guy is a ruler of a ragtag band of misfits. You know, um, Islamic State is neither a state nor Islamic. You know, it's a deviant group of gangsters driven by anger and hatred and thirst for power. They're, and, and they're using Islam to reach their goals. They, being, being originally Muslim, they know how to use the Quran, the words of the Prophet, anything else like that, to twist things around in order to attract recruits. Uh, and they're also doing a fantastic PR and media campaign. Uh, but they're also setting their own chiefs up as judge and executioner at the same time. This was never part of Sharia law, you know. To have some half-witted uh, folk, you know, person up there, you know, being the judge and executioner. I mean, he can do whatever he wants. And brutal brutality is certainly part of their uh, method um, in enforcement. 
in, and in their theological worldview, there's only two camps. You know, there's the camp of Islam and its faithful, the Darul Islam, and the camp of the Kufr and the hip, hip, and the hypocrisy, the Jews, Crusaders, and their and their allies. So it's so it's black and white. There's no shades of gray. And and even amongst the faithful, pretty much it's them who define who the faithful is. If you don't pledge allegiance, you don't follow ISIS. You're not a Muslim. You can call yourself a Muslim. They don't call you a Muslim. And if you and if they don't call you Muslim, it's okay for them to kill you. So ISIS has killed many hundreds or thousands more Muslims than it has ever killed Westerners. It's something that the Western media ignores. You know, it, it has totally ignored. But ISIS is more of a threat to Islam. This is more of a civil war inside Islam going on. Uh, than a threat to the West. I'm not discounting the fact that it is a threat to the West, but in terms of killings, it's, it's affected a lot more. Um, the territorial gains are here. Uh, they've been pretty proactive. The ones in red are the ones that um, ISIS has been pushed back from. Uh, just going rapidly forward to Syria and Bashar al-Assad, who is the embattled president there. I mean, when you read that, and I'll read it for those of you at the back who can't one of his famous quotes is, when we analyze this war in a materialistic way and ask, when is it going to end, and who will be the winner and the loser, it means that we do not see the end game. And it puzzled me for a while, and then it, it occurred to me, this guy's smart. He doesn't care about the material loss of the cities, houses, and the deaths of people. He's looking at the end game. Will I survive? Because he's seen what happened to Libya. He's seen what happened to Egypt. He doesn't want to be removed militarily or otherwise. He's there to stay because he knows if he leaves, who's going to take him. So he's looking after the end game. And who gets killed in the meantime, he doesn't care. And finally, this kind of shows the complexity of Syria in terms of the tribes and the regions. Every one of those colors is a different tribal group, religious group. Iraq was relatively easy, right? You had the Shias, Sunnis, Kurds. Pretty, you know, three major groups. Look at this one here. We can't even figure out who's fighting for who. Yeah. That's it for me, thank you. Yes, sir. Could you just say a little more about Assad and the end game? And well, I mean, he was really surprised by the whole opposition. I think he always felt that uh, because he was the son of Hafiz al-Assad, long dynasty, that he would have power and pretty much authoritative power. He had the army behind him. A lot of his Alawite and Druze followers are part of the army, major part of it. So I think he was taken aback by the fact that the opposition started and then it took over quite rapidly. Um, and for him, the end game, I believe, is to try and ride it out. You know, He's been able to successfully bring in the Russians, so he has their backing. They're in there militarily. They're bombing the Nusra Front, which is an Al-Qaeda group. They're bombing the Free Syria Army. Uh, they're taking care of and then the U.S. is taking care of uh, bombing parts of ISIS. So pretty much worldwide forces are taking care of his opposition. So that's allowing him space to regroup and take over the, the, nuclear, uh, the nucleus of Syria. If he can hold on to Damascus and his corridor to the Mediterranean all the way to Aleppo, I think he's got it made. And he's just going to ride this out as far as he can. And, you know, let's not be ignorant of the fact that we're all players in this. You know, I mean, we keep hearing that ISIS is this and uh, refugees are this, but America's part of this. You know, we're, we're all part of the Iraq, Iran, uh, Syria campaign and the whole theater. You know, we've got our fingers in this. Yes, sir. I recall a couple of years ago when ISIS was first getting started seeing a report on CBS News on television that the nub core of ISIS really started in an American, the biggest, the largest American POW camp in, in Iraq. Is, is, is there some truth to that? You know, disgruntled soldiers and, and others. That's, that's kind of where it really got its start. Uh, 
Is that your take on this? Um, I'm not exactly sure whether that is true, but I wouldn't be surprised by it. Um, if anything, you'll follow from my presentation with said, you know, said Kutub um, and Ayman al Zawari, and a lot of these folks in opposition, really what they're after, even bin Laden, I would be uh, almost wanting to say, is they wanted to form, have their voices heard within their countries and effect change within their countries. But the fact that they could not, in a democratic way, effect change within their countries, they've gone, they've gone military. You know, they've gone, they've gone to violence. So when you kind of torture people, and uh, it has a profound effect on, on them. I mean, Eman al Zawari is a very key personality. I mean, it's almost because he was captured, tortured in the Egyptian jail, it really hardened him. It kind of showed that there's no way I can talk to this government and effect change. The only way I'm gonna do it is through violence. Uh, and it could be very much the same case with the Iraqi soldiers, you know, they kind of saw that there's no way that I can really effect change here. The only way that I'm going to effect change is banding together with this other, you know, group of ex-Saddam Hussein <coughs> soldiers and other Sunni tribal loyalists and form this, uh, you know, this group. Okay. Okay. I'll take some more questions while the technology is trying to be fixed. Yes, the lady in front. Um, going way back to the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, in an account that I read, and it's quite a while ago, um, the, the Roman author said that, yeah, the, the Brits were there at the time, the people in the government who were associated with the government were doing fine. Mm -hmm. Nobody was paying any attention to the common people, and that this teacher was upset because uh, the fine children, the, the children of the lower classes were not being educated, they did not have medical care, and so that, I, I, that one of his um, desires was to bring that sort of help to the common people and the children of the common people. And I guess my point, point and, I, and maybe you disagree, and I don't know how valid this is, but I guess what I think of is when we're raised in school and we go to our history classes in junior high and high school, we learn about <coughs> colonialism, it seems benign. It is not benign. And I think it did a lot of harm. It, it definitely did do a lot of harm. I mean, you've got to live under colonialism to know what it's like, obviously. Um, um, in an earlier presentation, I did say that I was born under colonialism, but I only knew two, two years of it, and as a baby, it's like, you know, you don't really know it. So I was really essentially born into, into independence. But your, your, your point about the brotherhood trying to look after the common man is actually you know quite valid uh, you know that's part of what Sayyid Qutb was trying to do was to look after the common man there is in these countries there's a lot of class differentiation there's the there's the nobility and the aristocratic class the upper class that has the power and the wealth you know it's not undifferent to this country where about the top five ten percent own pretty much all of the wealth of the country and then the lower eighty seven percent are kind of left trying to fend for themselves and part of the Islamic Brotherhood campaign, I think, which is still there today, is to try and look after the common man. And it's easier sell to spread the word of Islam amongst the poor people, right? Who else are they going to listen to? I mean, I've heard this story in this, this phrase in this country even, right? That what's the poor man going to do except go to the Bible and get his guns, right? That's, that's a phrase I've heard in this country for a long time. And it's the same in those countries, right? The, the, the poor people are gonna embrace Islam a lot more stronger, strongly than the rich folk, right? The rich folk, they've, they've got their luxury, so Islam becomes less meaningful in their daily lives. Um, and you saw that in the uh, Tahrir Square Spring Uprising in Egypt, where, yes, it was a nationwide movement. Everybody, the intellectuals, the, 
pro-democracy group, the Islamic Brother, everyone came together to, to overthrow Hosni Mubarak. Then the problem happened, what then? You know, the Islamic Brotherhood wanted to be the ones that would form the government. Everyone else, including the army, was very, very nervous about them. And we saw that in Algeria, there was the big uh, open election, you know, several years ago. And who won the election? It was the Islamic party. So we in the West can say, well, we want those countries to have a democratic election. We want the winner then to form a government. But if it becomes an Islamic party, we're scared. No, no, that can't happen because we're scared. And folks in that country are also scared. The upper crust folks and the educated folks, they're scared because you kind of saw what happened there in, in Iran, right? The Islamists can kind of say, all right, everything's going to be fine and we're going to have progress, you know, progress and all that, and then they clamp down. Women have to wear the hijab, women can't drive, or you, you can't go to school, you know, those kind of things. So it's hard to form a government that is a progressive Islamic government. I guess I'm still naive that I can think that maybe sometime down the road that that would happen, you know, but in a more educated sense. It does have it work. Okay. All right, we've got the next uh, presentation, which was Hanan Salah Wakbar running, so let's see if that works. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, The next presenter is Hanan Omar, a uh, graduate student from Saudi Arabia. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I would like to start with the Arabic language. That is mean in the name of Allah, the merciful. My name is Hanan Omar. I'm international student from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Actually, I'm studying education leadership doctoral program at the University of Montana. I decided to show you the real meaning of Allahu Akbar because when a Muslim says the praise of Allahu Akbar, many, pe many people connect that with jihad or bombing or terrorism. But that is not true. So I choose this YouTube brief explanation, the praise of Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, a phrase that is misused and abused. You may have heard it in reports covering terrorists in the news. You may have seen videos of sick, twisted minds screaming before explosions and beheadings. But we, Muslims, we know it when we celebrate when millions gather and concentrate, becoming one with no color, no race, and only faith, saying Allahu Akbar for the Almighty with one voice, one love, and no hate. We know it from every prayer five times a day. We say it in every occasion, and in every way. Allahu Akbar, when we are startled by beauty. Allahu Akbar, when we are frightened by disasters. Allahu Akbar, when we are scared and weak. Allahu Akbar, when we are joyful and at our peak. Allahu Akbar, the meaning of love and trust in a God that we worship all gathered in one phrase translates to God is the greatest. So don't confuse it. Don't allow terrorists to contaminate a peaceful religion and a phrase that is so great. When you hear it, let it show its true colors. Let it resonate that Allahu Akbar is about love and trust from 1.6 billion Muslims to the creator of our fate. 
Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, during every prayer, every memorable moment, and through it, we relate. Okay, well, thank you all for coming.